Today on With the First Pick, Summer Scouting continues, and we're talking tight ends and offensive linemen. I'm Ryan Wilson, that's Rick Spielman, and that's Mike Renner. And Mike, of course, will be joining us for all our Summer Scouting episodes over these next few weeks. And if you missed it, we already covered quarterbacks, wide receivers, and running backs. Check that out in the old podcast feed. All right, now time to dilly-dally, Rick. This is episode 168. How many days <laughs> to the 2025 NFL Draft? Mike, I know you have a calendar hidden somewhere in that apartment of yours or wherever you do these shows from. And I don't have to tell you this. I have to tell Ryan every day that there are actually 281 days left until the 2025 NFL draft. Hey, Mike, let me ask you something you've been doing. This is, I think your third or fourth podcast with us doing summer scouting. Mm -hmm. Give us both comps. <laughs> and, and, and more importantly, to, to, what, what do you think about the, the two grumpy old men that you've now been stuck with for the next few weeks? The dynamics impeccable. Uh, I have to say, I, I'm I'm honored that you guys would allow me to be a part of it each week. Truly, am. So it's been fun. I enjoy it every week. What do you think about that, Rick? Yeah, well, at least he doesn't have his Notre Dame stuff on today. We're going with the PDA, PGA T shirt today. So I'm saving the Notre Dame stuff for uh, Brady Quinn's golf outing next Monday. That's what I'm saving it for. <laughs> oh, look at that humble brag! You stuck that in there. You're going to be Brady Quinn's golf outing. Did you get an invite, Rick? No, I didn't tell Brady to go eat uh, or tell him that uh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> okay, there you <laughs> I go. Get it. Catch and yourself there. Those golf match. Uh, I think we'll be talking about some some uh, Notre Dame players shortly here. Um, all right, here's the deal. We're doing tight. Oh, Rick, before we get going, what's, what's on your shirt there? Let's give yeah, a shout out. This is Island Garage here on Periwinkle. It is promoting businesses back on the island as we come back off the hurricane. Number one in customer service, number one in satisfaction. And to tell you the truth, it's the only garage on the island. So <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it uh they actually put up with your nonsense when you dropped the Jeep off. Yeah, no, they dropped the Jeep off. And then before the hurricane hit, they told me to get the Jeep the heck out of there because they want to have responsibility for the Jeep, lots of Jeep anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh no, uh, it's a family-owned business, so we're trying to do everything we can just to get all the businesses up and running again here on the island. Yeah, it's been it's been two years now. Two years, two years since the hurricane, and they're rebuilding slowly. And Rick is doing his part. And you guys are about to have a new resident in the state of Florida in a couple of weeks. Oh, Mike Renner's moving down there. Oh boy, Florida man. Oh, finalize my plans. Work. Yeah, if you're ever over in Sanibel and need an oil change, let me know. I can get you a discount. <laughs> Got a deal. You know the first, guy. First order of business. Mike's getting his oil change once he arrives. All right, here's the deal. Uh, we've each separately ranked our top five tight ends and offensive linemen in this 2025 class, and then we'll combine our list for the overall ranking. We'll have some comps and some draft ranges and all that stuff that gets folks fired up. First things first, start with the old tight ends here. And if you're watching on YouTube... Great producer Harry has done uh, Yeoman's work here and putting together this graphic. You can see uh, Rick, Mike, and my own top five here. At the top, Colston Loveland out of Michigan. And then things get crazy. Uh, Mitchell Evans is uh, Notre Dame tight end. He's number two on Rick's list. Luke Lachey out of Iowa. Caden Priestcorn out of Ole Miss. And uh, Brant Keithy out of Utah. And uh, we all have Colston Lo uh, Loveland as our number one tight end. And then at number two for me, Clemson's. Uh, Jake Bringstool, Oscar Delp, number three out of Georgia for me, uh, Amari Niblick, uh, Niblack out of Texas, and then Tyler Warren out of Penn State. And then Mike has Loveland and then Oscar Delp, Terrence Ferguson out of Oregon, uh, the aforementioned Mitchell Evans, and then uh, the aforementioned Luke Lachey. So there's going to be uh, very few consensus picks on the old big board here with, with the first pick, but we'll hit on all these guys. And I'll just say this, Rick, before you get angry. These are five guys that I like, not necessarily the top five guys. And that reminds me, last year's list of guys that we talked about during summer scouting all made out pretty well. Uh, Brock Bowers, Kate Stover, Jatavian Sanders, Jaheim Bell all drafted. Jaheim Bell went a little later than probably he wanted to. And then Jalen Conyers we talked about at Arizona State. He came back to school. I think he transferred. I'm not sure where he's at. I have to double check. Uh, but he's not on the list this time around, but I'm sure we'll be talking about him at some point. All right, Harry, put up the old aggregate list, and we'll get this ball rolling here. First up, Colston Loveland. And uh, Mike, I'll come to you. It's very easy to see why he's number one on all of our lists. I mean, super productive, young. Uh, I mean, a lot of these guys we're going to talk about are young on this. But he's, you know, for only a sophomore to do what he did when he's 
he's kind of like an easy projection in the NFL because you already saw the usage in very much an NFL manner in that not only can he go in line, but he also can split wide. Obviously, you know, it's a little on the other side size right now, but it has to be expected. Not a lot of sophomore tight ends are like Michael Mayer where they're already, you know, NFL caliber sort of blockers. So hopefully he fills out a little bit more. I trust that he will, but just such a natural wide receiver, such easy route running ability. To me, even compared to a guy like Michael Mayer, who a lot of people had in first round mocks, I, I think he's a better prospect and a more projectable prospect as a receiver in terms of like athletic traits. Um, I, I wouldn't put him in the Cal Pitts, Brock Bowers. I, I don't think he's ever going to reach that status of prospect, but he's a pretty darn good one. Would not surprise me whatsoever if he ends up first rounder. So, uh, producer Harry, we need a bell. We need to ring the bell every time we get a Notre Dame name check. So Michael Mayer twice already. Uh, Rick, you're going to squeeze the squeeze balls to death when we get through this thing. So um, my point Brady is Brady Quinn reference as well. Brady Quinn. I mean, I well, he's going to the golf tournament, so he has to mention Brady Quinn. Um, Mike mentioned it. Colts is going to be a junior this year, so we'll we'll try to keep up with uh, with what classification they are as well. Six five two forty five unofficial. So uh, slightly on, on the undersized side, but. Uh, I was I was really impressed watching him, Rick, because I hadn't watched him closely because we've been watching Roman Wilson and J.J. McCarthy and all the other guys that were coming out. Uh, he's a lot of fun, and he does feel like, of all these tight ends, probably the, the most likely to end up in round one. Yeah, no question about it. I think he's a first-round talent. And when we get through these other guys, I think that everybody's all over the board right now. It's almost like pick your flavor on what you like and don't like in a tight end. But he's clearly number one. I think he is unique uh, in the receiving game as a playmaker. He has excellent hands. He can stretch the defense vertically. Um, very good route runner. What I was surprised about is how athletic he is after the catch uh, and the yards he makes and the explosive plays he makes after the catch. Just like all the guys we want to talk about, he does need to get stronger in a run game. But I think he truly fits his modern day tight ends in the NFL where he's going to be a mismatch. Uh, at the next level. Yeah, huge catch radius. I, I thought he gave both linebackers and safety types trouble in the middle of the field uh, for different reasons in terms of trying to cover them. And he had he had some yak ability. He, he's not looking to shy away from contact. All right, Rick, we'll get to your comp first, and then we'll play, a, play the old game, guess the comp for me and Mike after that. So who's your comp for old Colton? And, and I'm assuming first round, probably? Yeah, first round talent. And I went with Dalton Kincaid. Uh, because I oh, thought hey. Dalton Kincaid was long, linear, really good athlete in the passing game, made some eye-popping catches. So I saw a lot of similarities uh, in their game. Well, I, in this example at least, coming up, it might be a little easier. No Steelers uh, in my comps, so this should be a little easier for you. Well, just because you're self-conscious now because I pointed I it out on the last podcast. Well, I, I, I'm looking ahead. I, I messed up on one of these, so you, that'll be a layup for you. But but for this one, for Colton Loveland. Yeah, I'm surprised you you didn't go with a Pat Fryermuth. You're spoiling the plot. <laughs> 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 but not this time. Not for Colton. Uh, for Colston, excuse me. All right, so Mike or me, Zach Ertz, Tyler Eifert. I'm going to go with Zach Ertz for Mike and Eifert for you. And you would be wrong. <laughs> oh, first one I got wrong. These feel like similar type players. Uh, I mean, you know, you guys make fun of me for our comps, but these feel like they're in the same ballpark, Mike? They were the same draft, right? Uh, I believe. I heard nerds came out same year. Um, and they were that year. I was like, there are similar players coming out. So, yeah, I, I do think I think why when Eifert is he's not like a linear explosive athlete Loveland you know I Eifert wasn't necessarily either Ertz isn't really either they're not like true speed vertical guys like maybe a George Kittle or, or some other tight ends around the NFL they get open more because they're just like all around good athletes and, and so that's what I see with Colson Love yeah I'm with you so uh they play Texas on September 7th and then at the end of the season they play Ohio State uh Michigan does so those are games to watch and Mike you think first round as well is that right I do yeah awesome all right next up on our list Oscar Delp, tight end out of Georgia. Rick, uh, he wasn't in your top five. Did you walk, watch Oscar Delp by any chance? Yeah, I watched him a little bit. I just, there was still, there was flashes, but I didn't, uh, you know, I'd like to see a pretty good amount of plays just to see what he's going to be like is a true full-time starter without Bowers. And I understand Bowers missed some time, 
but I do recognize this kid's athletic skill set in the passing game. He's another long, linear tight end. The one thing uh, I thought he had some run after catch ability. The one thing that kind of stuck out to me, he does need to get stronger as a blocker, but we said the same thing about Bowers when we we're talking yeah. about him last year at this time. But this kid has some grit, and he'll try to get after you and fight you a little bit. He just needs to get stronger. But I just didn't see enough I, um, to put him in the top five right now, but I can very easily see by the time this is said and done that he's in the top five uh, when we're talking about this at the end of the season. Yeah, he was targeted just 29 times last season, obviously in part because when Brock Bowers is on the field, Brock Bowers is the guy you're throwing the ball to. Hit one drop uh, in those 29 targets. 6'5", 245, similarly listed weight as Colston Loveland. We'll find out exactly if that's true or not. And he played almost half his his snaps in the slot. Um, what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I thought he was probably, of all the guys I watched, the best athlete. Like I thought from a pure size speed perspective. And yeah, he's undersized, but there's not a lot of fat on this guy. Like he's 245 <laughs> with, and he looks as cut up and the body habit is as good as any of these tight ends. So I think there's room for him to fill out, especially being only, you know, a rising junior uh, there at Georgia. So that's, that's what wins at the NFL at tight end, right? It's why, um, you know, teams covet the size and speed at the tight end position because to produce like a wide receiver more often than not, you better be able to move like a wide receiver. So he's one of the few in this class that can, and so it wouldn't even surprise me if, you know, filling for Brock Bowers, if he has a big year, this guy gets into the first round conversation. Like that's the type of caliber athlete we're talking about. But to Rick's point, he barely played, right? He's, he's He was a backup last year. Obviously, Bowers did go down for a few weeks. He did step in. But we really haven't seen enough to know for sure. But I will bet on that kind of athlete. I think it was the top ranked tight end in his recruiting class as well. Like th there's a lot of reasons pointing to a big year from this guy. Yeah, as you point out, he's also a junior. Uh, I said he was a long starting tight end. He looked fast on tape. Good athlete. He uses speed and leverage and body to win at the catch point. We talked about the only the 29 targets, uh, but the athleticism and the speed are, are, are huge. Hey, Rick, how common or uncommon is it to see a, a young player who doesn't play a lot at the tight end position and then uh, uh, switch flips and they go from just a guy on the team because you're on, on a stacked Georgia team to a guy that's the top, 50 top 75 player yeah i don't know what switch flips mean but uh trying to decipher that definition turn uh, on the turn on the the the, the kerosene lantern you used the 200 years ago does that help <laughs> <laughs> yeah well they, yeah a lot of guys switch flips uh what, yeah <laughs> I, I, I do recognize, like I said, I just, before I want to stamp him as a top five guy, I recognize the top five flashes that you see. Um, and now's the time where he's going to be the number one tight end and he's going to get his opportunity to shine. So, and he's got a really good quarterback, the number one quarterback on a board coming out this year in back. So, uh, there's no reason why he shouldn't switch flips or, flip the switch like other people say but <laughs> i would say yeah this guy has all the traits it's just you just see pieces of it and i just want to see it consistent week in and week out uh mike if you haven't noticed and you you would have to be dead not to notice rick laughs at his own jokes more than anyone else does <laughs> and by the way switch flipped f-l-i-p-p-e-d that makes sense that doesn't make sense to me so okay well, let's let's clarify that. Also worth noting, um, and Rick, I don't know if you saw the SEC media days, but uh, our guy Carson Beck's catching some heat for the way he dressed up. He had on a, like a Carolina blue sports jacket, then he had a mock turtleneck on with a chain overneath it, over top oh, it, over it. Podcast in his future. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a uh, a comment on the fit, as the kids say, Mike? I didn't see it. I'm no. embarrassed to say I didn't see it. I need to go check it out. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, we'll take a quick break and maybe producer Harry will look at the picture of Carson Beck at the SEC Media Days. We'll talk about that and the actual tight ends right after this. At CBS Sports Galazzo Network, we're bringing you the game. The madness of Messi arrives! Breaking down the game. This is unlike anything else in the world. And changing the game. Get it all for nil. That means free. Wow. And all day long. 24-7. Rick, you threw me off my game. I forgot to do the comps for Oscar Delp. 
Yeah, well, just, well, you can always flip switches or switch flips, whatever, whatever you want to do. All right. Uh, even producer Harry second shots at me in the rundown about my uh, my comps. So that's we're at that point. Uh, you didn't have a comp for him. Uh, I don't think unless you have one in the Rolodex, just because he wasn't wasn't among your top five. But I can give you the guess which comp we had. Yeah, game. yeah I like to do in the guess game. This is a layup. The, the, I didn't. I don't know why I th didn't think this through. Um, if <laughs> producer Harry joked, if this is a drinking game, we'd all be dead. <laughs> So, uh, Pat Fryermuth or Kellen Winslow Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have Mike guess at that one. <laughs> Drink. Uh, it's a different right, players. Fair enough. Man, Kellen Winslow Jr., that's that's athletic, though. I mean, Fryermuth's a good athlete, but he ain't Kellen Winslow Jr. athletic coming out. I, I think that's what Delph could be, honestly. Yeah. I, I, I see him. I see low four or five kind of guy. Ooh. Mm -hmm. He's a good player, I, and it's going to be fun to watch him in that offense and see how how he develops for sure. Uh, Georgia plays at Alabama in late September, and then uh, mid October they face Texas. All right, I next start, trying to get up on the social media comparisons that'll be up all over the place. Kellen yeah. Winslow Jr. coming out, Still not on. off field, not off field, <laughs> just on field. Yeah, uh, I, there's not so many ways lot. I could go with that. I won't go with any of them because I don't want to get in trouble. All right. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a bold one. Uh, I was trying to stick to on the field too, but yeah, Rick wasn't having it. Next up, um, uh, Mike, I feel like you should just go ahead and take over here. You can introduce the guy, and you can you can talk first about him. Mitchell Evans. I actually had him lower than number three. I had him number four, but I, I like him. I think he's incredibly reliable. I obviously saw that last year, four hundred twenty-two yards, and I believe only uh, eight games um, before he got injured. Just big body, you know. We're not talking about size concerns with him. He's 260 pounds. He uses that size really well. 14.6 yards per catch, I think, speaks to a little bit of athleticism that he has, even if he's probably going to run over a 4.7. Like, he's not a straight-line burner by any means, but he can make contested catches down the football field. And they can create a little bit after the catch. Like, he is a guy who is difficult to bring down, runs really hard post-catch. So a lot of good things to like. Um I'm glad he came back to school as a Notre Dame fan, but I thought he could have come out last year and probably been around like a fourth rounder. I think he comes back, probably bumps the stock up more towards like the third round after this. Year. Do you think he got hurt in late October? You talked about that. Um, I think it was in the pit game. It, would he have had an opportunity or does he have an opportunity to be better than Michael Mayer? No, no, no. I, I similar, like Mayer was a much more agile athlete at that size i think evans is still going to be limited as an all-around athlete and we'll probably see that in his draft stock i think he's just capped to a degree of where he can go rick i think he could actually end up being better oh that's good um but i will gonna kind of lean towards mike on this one now that i got a new partner in crime that i can uh <laughs> double, you. Yeah. double team me yeah i know i know <laughs> I, I thought this kid was, out of all the guys, one other guy I thought was just a true Y tight end, which seems to be a unicorn that you're trying to look for right now um, because I think you can line him up at the line of scrimmage. I did like his toughness and grit as a run blocker. He tries to sustain and finish. They all need technical work. I thought he's a short to intermediate pass catcher, but I thought he had a huge catching radius and very good in contested situations. And he surprised me a little bit. He's not in that elite athletic category for tight ends, but he got yards after he caught the ball, and, and he's a better athlete than I thought. I said his athleticism and his speed were above the line, not elite, but above the line to, to uh, transfer to the next level. Um, not a unique playmaker, but an all-around really true why tight end and that was only this is the only guy i really saw as a true why uh they can actually line up on the line of scrimmage and be effective not only in the passing game but as a run blocker um i didn't think he was he played half his snaps in the slot and i i know he can line up he is bigger i think he's plenty good enough as an athlete and i think to mike's point huge catch radius and then he looks to run over guys and then he does run over guys and he ran away from guys in the open field as well i wasn't crazy about the the pass the um run blocking that i saw but i didn't watch every single snap of his uh that said i don't disagree with anything you guys said i think i'm higher on him than you two are well i'll say if you watch him he made two espn cbs highlight type catches the one-hander in duke game and the one-hander yeah. in the uh 
Ohio, Ohio State game that are that are pretty tells you what type of hands and coordination he does have. All right, I'm gonna let me think. I don't I don't. How did Michael Mayer do last year at, for the Raiders? Do you know off the top of your head? He wasn't used that often, right? Not much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking to, towards a dollar bet, a long term dollar bet here. I think um, Mitchell has a better rookie season than Michael Mayer. What do you think about that, Rick? No, I'm not going to argue that. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Who, who drafted him? And I'll let you know. What'd you say? Who drafted him? And then I'll let you know. Oh, I can't tell you that. All right. Let's do some comps here. Rick, you can start and then we'll play the game. Yep. I, I kind of put him because he was in a lot of contested situations. Uh, he's a big, bigger version of this player. I put him in kind of a Trey McBride category. I don't hate it. I, I love Trey McBride coming out. Yeah, his catch the ball. Trey McBride was a gritty blocker. Um, probably better football player than athlete. He's playing really well in Arizona right now and has really blossomed. But I saw some Trey McBride traits in him. What round? I have him in the uh, second to third round right now. Okay. Yeah, that's where I feel. And I think Mike's right. Like fourth round felt about right maybe uh, a year ago, eight months ago or whatever. Um, but I think he has an opportunity to, to build on that. All right, Rick. Match the name with the comp. Brent Selleck and Vance McDonald. Jeez. <laughs> Two old school guys. <laughs> I'm going to go. Mike said Vance McDonald. Vance McDonald, by the way, at the end of his career, played for the Steelers. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why, as soon as I said Vance McDonald, I'm like Steeler. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. I, I, the Steelers thing, I don't even read, read. All my comps are Steelers comps. You know what? I'm going to say this, and, and Rick, get the extra squeeze ball out. I thought at times down the field as a receiver, Mitchell was had some showed some gronkiness. Like he's not Rob Gronkowski, but I thought in terms of the size, in terms of the – the, the long legged high knee running and people having trouble tackling him. I saw a little bit of that as well, but I mean, the guys we're talking about his comps are physical tight ends as well, but um, he's not Gronk, but I saw glimpses of just a he, big, he's strong not as athletic as Gronk. But like I said, I saw the two one hand catches. Yeah. Those are pretty spectacular in the way and Gronk he... slipped because he was injured coming out of Arizona. Right. Yeah, I believe. I, yeah. Yeah. I think he had hit some injuries. Uh, Mike second round as well. He's what you thinking. I think more third at this Ooh. point, but we'll, we'll see. Okay. All right. So Rick and I are higher on uh, Mitchell in terms of where he's drafted, Mitchell Evans, uh, than Mike, but not by much. So I think late second, um, late second to early third is what we're talking about here. Notre Dame plays Florida State in November, and then they play USC in late November and second to third round. All right. Next up. I actually didn't watch this young man. So uh, Mike and Rick can take over here. Uh, Rick, I'll start, start with you. You're our Iowa tight end correspondent, Luke Lachey, Richard Sr. Again, played in an offense where it's hard to tell. So how did you figure out that he was going to be good? It, it, it was hard to get a really good feel for this kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it honestly is. I mean, uh, quarterback play has not been the strength of the Iowa program over the last couple of years. But again, I like this guy's side. I think he's a good athlete. Uh, he's another one that I, I always kind of upgrade guys, at least if they're going to get in there and fight and, uh, as a run blocker. And this guy does that. Uh, most of his production came underneath, just like Laporta's and Kittle's and everybody else that has come out of Iowa. He has enough speed to stretch the seam, soft hands, had a few drops when he had to adjust to the ball. Uh, just okay athlete after the catch, nothing unique. I think Jury's still out, but I think he can move up the draft boards if he stays healthy and has a productive year. Uh, he missed most of the season with an injury last year. What do you think? But you got to say that Iowa has produced some pretty good Kittle, sure. DJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, uh, Sam Laporta. So I'm going to go with uh, the history of Iowa tight ends on this one. All right, fair enough. He he just uh, here it is. Twenty. <laughs> he ended after just three games. He had an ankle injury and missed the rest of the season. All right, so he's not tough. Okay, got it. All right, Mike, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think you could really see how highly Iowa thought of him in the two games he played last year because they were throwing him multiple screens, really trying to feature him in that offense when they have some other good tight ends on the roster, like Eric All was on that roster and whatnot. So like he was a guy that they really wanted to get involved before obviously the injury. So hopefully a big year for him coming up. But what differentiates him, I think, from some of these other guys in this list is just the frame. Like he's listed at six six, 
looks every bit of 6'6", can really go up and make plays outside of his frame. So a massive catch radius, doesn't drop a lot of balls. I think PFF had him charged for only two drops his entire career. So there's that. I think his footwork's great. You saw that. That's why they're trying to throw him screens. Out of the back there was the fact that he can actually really, you know, move laterally post-catch or on his routes. I don't think he's a good athlete by any means, but I think he's good enough to start in the NFL. But again, I think we'd be talking about him a lot differently had we seen a whole year out of him, and hopefully we get to see that this year. Yeah, he'll be a redshirt senior this year. Um, Mike Comp, and where do you think he ends up range-wise? I, I still don't like think he's – I think those top three guys that we mentioned – um, and actually, one guy outside the top five or are, are like the day two tight ends at this point. I see him a little outside day two, more of a guy you're okay starting, not necessarily looking for high end play out of him. So my comp for him was someone like Jack Doyle. Yeah, I mean that feels like your comp too, Rick. No, my comp wasn't Jack Doyle. No, but that type of player. Yes. Yeah, I had him in the fourth round. He's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my comp was. Tucker Croft, when he okay. came out, yeah. that was a little bit limited athlete, but a big body uh, physical guy that can make some plays, just not a unique athlete. So I kind of I kind of went with uh, Kraft. All right, like it. Next up, did you have a comp for this guy? You didn't do this guy. I didn't watch. I didn't watch Luke Lachey. Okay, there's time for that. Okay. I instead was watching uh, Jake Brenning stool out of Clemson. Oh God. <laughs> he's a senior. He's listed at 6'6", 235. Uh, so he he is not uh, an inline tight end uh, just by the, the eyeball test. Um, he played 60% of, 60 of his snaps outside. Um, but I was impressed with him because that offense is sometimes hard to watch as well. Uh, I thought he had build-up speed, and he ran away from second, third-level defenders when he got in space, showed the ability uh, with yards after the catch, had good hands, ran crisp routes for for being a tight end and showed his ability to high point the ball and make contested catches downfield. Um, I mean, there are plenty of occasions on tape where he's stacking defenders from the slot. And uh, got to, the more you watched and the more you felt about him being a, a pretty good athlete, um, even by tight end standards, as they sort of turn into these uber athletes. I don't know if either of you had a chance to watch Jake or if I'm the only one that uh, is riding this train. I watched him. Okay, uh, what do you think? So my worry, I've been burned by undersized tight ends. At the NFL level... If you can't get respected as an inline blocker, and at 6'6", six, six, two, listed at 230 last year, you said 235 now, that's that's just below. You're getting treated as a wide receiver, right? No one's going to ask you to block a defensive end in the NFL at that size. So he needs like, and especially 6'6", six, six, 235 versus maybe like a Jaheim Bell who was like a 6'2", 235. It's a much different sort of body mass distribution. He's still really skinny. So he has to get at 6'6", six, six, like up into the 250 range before we're talking about a guy who can block DN. So that's worrisome to me. And then, so if you're not, you know, getting respected as being on the block in line, defend or block in line and defensive ends, you might as well be a wide receiver. And if we're calling him just a wide receiver, I saw a guy who was like borderline draftable. If you called him just a wide receiver, like sixth, seventh round sort of guy. So it's just difficult for me. I, I need to see him get up to real NFL tight end size before I'm going to go to bat for him. Obviously, like there's a lot to like, but. I didn't see like Darren Waller who ran in the four fours as a 230 pounder. That makes me think that when he adds 20 more pounds, he'll still be an athletic tight end. I didn't quite see that high end of an athlete. Yeah. Rick, what do you do with athletic undersized tight ends in terms of how you talking about them and how they fit into the offense when you're running a team? Draft them in a sixth and seventh round. Don't put him number two on your list. All right, there you have it. <laughs> you know who just and that's why and that's why you're doing watch, a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't I didn't watch this guy yet, but I watched the North Carolina kid Nesbit, I think is his name. Yeah. It's almost the same, sounded very similar. This kid's Long, but he's only 230 pounds, couldn't block his way out of a paper bag. Um, and then he's just like a big glorified non-athletic receiver. Yeah, that's not this kid. And I would argue. Since that's two against one now, and I'm fine with that. My whole life, I've had to fight uphill. I would argue that Jake is a better blocker than Mitchell, pound for pound. So, come we'll on, find we'll find out together this fall. But that's what makes this great. You guys hating on Dabo Sweeney? <laughs> you guys are gonna be in Tyler on that call Dabo. into the show when Dabo goes off on you two. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we talked about Sweeney as a tight end. <laughs> Dabo's a coach. Remember, we got angry at Tyler for calling in, talking, talking all that trash. Yeah. 
Well, we're not talking about Dabo. We're talking about uh, this 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 long bean pole tight end that you like so much. Who do you think my comp is, Rick? I don't know. Is there a comp? Yeah, I don't know if you'll like it or not. This guy, um, I think, would have been drafted much higher had he not suffered the injuries he had concussion wise. Grant Calcaterra, because he was a, a bean pole as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No love for Jake bringing a stool. That's okay. All right, some other guys worth mentioning. Mike, we'll start uh, with your number three because uh, we've talked about Rick's top three guys here. Terrence Ferguson out of Oregon. Um, I did not watch Terrence. I don't know if Rick did. So, Mike, you can start off with him. Yeah, I, I just think he's very fluid. And you see it after the catch. Very slippery. Um, just a smooth athlete. He reminded me a little bit of Mark Andrews coming out of Oklahoma just because – he's really not an inline tight end. Like mo most of his snaps are slot or even split wide in that Oregon offense. He's not an inline blocker, but they list him at 256. You know, Mark Andrews coming out was, I believe, in the similar range where he played wide receiver, but was really real tight end size. So that's intriguing to me. Um, I think he's like, I had him third on my list ahead of guys like Mitchell Evans, Luke Lachey that we talked about. So uh, oh, gonna be a rising senior. Uh, excited to see how he fares uh, with some targets opening up in that Oregon offense this year. All right, Rick. Caden Priest going out of Ole Miss and Brant Keithy out of uh, Utah. And Dalton Kincaid sort of made his name when Keithy got hurt uh, a few years ago at Utah. He's still there. You want to talk about those two young men? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, the Utah kid, I, when I watched the Florida game, he had nine catches for 105 yards and a touchdown. And before Dalton Kincaid became the flavor of the month, back in the year before, this kid made a lot of plays in a passing game. I think he's just a unique athlete. He's not a, on the line why. He's a try-to-mismatch guy. Uh, I think he's a later-round guy, but because these young guys or these guys that are undersized, that are pretty athletic, they usually take a swing on him. If he can come back, miss most of last year. Uh, with an ACL. So I don't know if he'll be the same athlete coming back or not, but I kind of made him a, a Jaheim Bell type uh, comparison. And then Caden uh, Pickstrong, or, or was it Pick? Uh, Freeze Corn. Yeah. What, yeah. Freeze Corn. <laughs> <We'll miss. laughs> he is the kid that was transferred from Memphis. And this was another big body that I thought could be a potential. Uh, true wide tight end. He reminded me a little bit of Jeremy Rucker when he came out of Ohio State. Will be one of those guys that uh, is just a solid, steady Eddie player. Nothing unique about him. But I'm interested to see since he transferred from Memphis to Ole Miss, uh, how he stacks up against this SEC competition. Yeah, and I like the, the other. I like the oh, other yeah, Ole Miss transfer too, Daquan Wright from Virginia Tech. So they actually have two guys who I really like tight end transfer. So. Uh, and uh, the two guys, four and five on my list of young men that I watched, Amari Niblack out of Texas. Rick, did you watch him because he was at Alabama? Uh, no, I did not. He Alabama transfer. I think he has a chance to be a little bit better than Jatavian Sanders. He didn't get a ton of options. Uh, he didn't get a ton of targets last year, much like Oscar Delp didn't uh, because he was at Alabama. Uh, but I think he has, has a chance to to go down that road. And to Mike's point about these sort of quote-unquote undersized tight ends, Jatavian Sanders was a fourth-round pick, and we were – Spent a lot of time talking him up as a top 100 guy. Now you had and, him as your number one tight end last year at this time. Yeah, he just refused to block behind, it. Behind Browers, Bowers, I should say. Yeah, he he really did not want to block, and I don't think he got better at it. We talked to him at the combine. He's a great kid, but he he still wasn't blocking anybody. And then um, Tyler Warren out of Penn State. He he uh, my comp for him was Payne Durham. So that type of player, I don't think he's that as good as Payne was coming out. I think I like Payne a little more than some other people did. Um, but he's another guy to keep an eye on that I, I watched. I thought he has a chance to be a day three guy. Anything else we want to talk about here? Do we hit everybody? I feel like we did. All right. Let's take a quick break. We're going to talk about some of these offensive linemen right after this. We well, you need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. All right, offensive linemen are up. So we just sort of combine tackles, guards, centers. You can talk about whoever you want. And again, my list, I added some names on here that we 
everyone didn't talk about just for some diversity to mix things up. But a lot of the names are the same, especially at the top. And if you're watching on old YouTube, you can see producer Harry's graphic. Will Campbell's number one on Rick's list out of LSU. Uh, he's a tackle. Kevin Banks Jr. out of Texas is second. Tyler Booker, the guard out of Alabama. Emory Jones out of LSU. And then uh, Jonah Savanaya out of Arizona. The tackle is Rick's top five. And these names are going to look pretty similar. I had Kelvin Banks at the top, Savanaya, Will Campbell, then Donovan Jackson, the guard out of Ohio State. And then I watched Wyatt Millam, the tackle out of West Virginia. And then Mike's got Kelvin Banks, Will Campbell, Emory Jones, Alabama's Parker Brais uh, Brail Brailsford, excuse me, and then Savanaya also makes this list at five. All right, let's start at the top. The aggregate rankings. Calvin Banks Jr. wins out, Rick. So, uh, Rick, I'll, I'll let you start first because you had him number two on your list, but he's number one because Mike and I liked him as our number one. So what are your thoughts on junior tackle? Calvin yeah, Banks. no, uh, athletic, um, very good in the running game, uh, can create movement at the point, excellent athlete on space on screens and at the second level, uh, good feet to play left tackle and pass pro. Uh, my biggest struggle with him is when the edge rushers or these long athletic rushers get on his edges, which is outside or inside shoulder, because I don't think he has ideal length. So he's one of those smaller defensive tackles that we've talked about over the last couple of years. The Skaronskis of the world, I don't know if he's as tall as Skaronsky, and I don't know his arm length, so that may get answered when we get to the uh, – to the combine or even last year, uh, Fatanu, the kid out of Washington, uh, who was a left tackle. So I think he is more powerful than Fatanu from last year from Washington. I just don't know about his ideal length and if that's going to hold up against these long uh, athletic edge rushers at the next level. He'll be a very good player, day one starter. I just think teams will have some internal discussions on whether they move him inside the guard or whether they keep him out at left tackle. There it is. Very first player. We're talking about moving him to guard. He played all the snaps at left tackle uh, last season. We don't know his arm length, but you, you sort of hinted at it, but you saw stuff on tape that gave you not concern, but pause about his ability. Length no, I don't have any pause about his ability. What I have pause about pause about is his length. Yeah. And with some of those guys with longer arms, uh, work on his edges, his length didn't show up like it does on some of the other guys. Okay. But he's, to me, the best athlete at left tackle that's coming yeah. out this year's draft by far. I felt like he was incredibly athletic. I said he's a better run blocker than in pass protection, but it was pretty close. He was an earth mover in the run game. I thought he moved well laterally. He he seemed to stay. Some of the things you see when these guys try to get to the second level in these combo blocks, they have struggle, struggle with balance. There was no such issue with that. Um I, I liked him a lot. Obviously, he was my number one guy. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I think he's really a special athlete. It, it, the kind where not a lot of guys in that caliber end up failing, where it's just he's not only explosive, he's not only strong, but he can move laterally, and he's got great balance. Like There was a rep against Rice where he, he kind of whiffs on a combo at the line of scrimmage because he sees a slant. Kind of like He puts both his hands on the ground and gets up and still pancakes the linebacker at the second level. That's just things that most 320 pounders just like can't do, you know, like guys just, they don't have that body control. They don't have that wherewithal at that size, most guys. And he does. So I, I the upward trajectory of his career too, from true freshman year to this last year, you saw improvement. I think you're going to see even more. And all the guys we're talking about on this list, Evaluating a sophomore offensive lineman versus, you know, a lot of guys we've seen in recent years being fifth, sixth year guys. It's just a completely different sort of uh, place in their lives. Like it, to be a 19, 20 year old having to block, you know, 22, 23 year olds versus being the old man on the block is just night and day in terms of how hard it is. So for them to be doing it this quickly, very impressive. I, I think he probably ends up a top 10 guy just because that caliber athlete ends up going there. But to Rick's point, like, yes, 6'4", 324 is like he is on the smaller side. I still do think with his movement skills, though, I'm keeping him at offensive tackle. Uh, right. True junior as well. So the the youth is also there. Rick, comp and draft range, sir. Yeah, he's a first round, probably top 10 talent. Um, and I, you know, I talked about Skaronsky because I try to get all these shorter guys that have enough athletic skills to play left tackle, but I don't know their length. 
we talked about Fatanu, but I went with um, Elijah Vera Tucker when he played left tackle uh, at USC. Although I think this kid is a better athlete at left tackle than Elijah Vera Tucker was, but I seen that same kind of power, especially in the run game. Short arms. I thought I thought Elijah Vera Tucker did really well at left tackle for a USC, but I'm partial to guys with short arms. I thought Peter Skaronsky had a play tackle in the NFL, but again, no one agrees with me. Uh, all right, Rick, you ready to play the game? Yep. Tristan Wirfs and Dwayne Brown. Ooh. Both those guys are bigger than this kid. Tristan Wirfs was a right tackle coming out of Iowa, although he moved to the left side this year. And uh, I'm going to go with Mike and Wirfs. Nope. No, really. You're I'm a off today. I, I'm glad Mike talked about the athleticism. That's what I thought about when I saw Tristan Works. Obviously, to your point, he played right tackle. He's moved to the left side since. And Calvin Banks uh, is a is a left tackle. But I think that's – I don't know if he can jump out of the pool and land on his feet, but I do like the athleticism. And, um, yeah, Mike went with Dwayne Brown. You're not good at this game, Rick. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at comps. You're not good at matching the comps to the person. All right, Texas plays at Oklahoma on October 12th as far as games to watch, and then Georgia the very next week. We all agree, probably top 10 talent. Next up, Will Campbell, Jr. out of LSU, and his teammate is also on this list, and we'll talk about him as well. Um, played all 779 snaps at left tackle in 2023. And, Rick, my first thought when watching Will is that he, he looks to be incredibly upright. Is that just me? Is that okay? Like, do you have any issues with that? Because he didn't necessarily get pushed around. It was just something that I noticed when I started watching him. Because he has, in my opinion, he he's not a true elite left tackle athlete. I think he has some lower body stiffness. Mm, okay. Um, but his length uh, helps make up for some of his shortcomings at the left tackle position. Because um, I, I think he's really sound technique-wise. I didn't watch the pass rusher versus Rice. Mike, I'm sorry about that. I try to watch this guy versus Verse. And... <laughs> <laughs> He's coming sorry, for you, Mike. That's, that's the first my, time I'm going to fall. I got smart ass every once in a while on this <laughs> podcast. And I, I watch just go it. deeper. No, I get it. I get it. I just go deeper. <laughs> I go against Dallas Turner, try to guys, you know, maybe that Rice kid, I'm missing something. I got to go back and watch tape. Yep. But <laughs> I think this kid plays with a lot of smarts and awareness for a guy that's a little stiffer. Through his lower body, uh, he does play on his feet. He's not on the ground a lot. You can't rush. If you rush him down the middle, you're done because he has great anchor. Uh, his length helps him with his lack of athleticism as a true left tackle. But I think teams are going to fall in love with this kid because he plays with grit and toughness, even though he has some athletic limitations. But I think he's going to be a tone setter on someone's offensive line. Uh, I'll circle back when we talk about the draft range because I have a question for you there, Rick, but I'll ask um, Mike what he thinks. Uh, how did he do? How did Will Campbell do against Rice? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't play Rice last year. I, I think he's actually the better player right now. If we're talking about Will Campbell versus Kelvin Banks. Like I think he is better. Oh, oh, I thought you were going to say Henry right Jones, now. but he's but you think he's a better player than than Banks? Okay, interesting. Yes, I think he's the best off tackle in the country right now. That being said, like he's got a bad body for the position. Like it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing as Kelvin Banks. He doesn't quite have that caliber of traits, but he's more technically sound. I think he's super consistent. There's really is a lot to like. He holds 320 pretty easily. Um, to me, I, I think he's just a plug and play left tackle at the NFL level may not be an all pro, but I think this guy's a future pro bowler that, you know, is I think both these guys are top ten picks when it's all said and done. Oh, interesting. With Will Campbell, it's just very easy for him. A lot of the stuff he does. So, a uh, big fan of his game. I think he might be the toughest offensive lineman that we're going to talk about. Um, I talked about him playing upright. That said, I thought he anchored really well. Plays with heavy hands, um, like the old pass rush chop. He seems to be able to withstand that no problem. I thought Jared Verse gave him issues to make the Florida State reference, but that. So what? It's Jared Verse. There's a reason Jared Verse is a first-round pick and one of the strongest edge rushers in the draft class last year. Um, I liked him better as a north-to-south run blocker. I, I don't know about his – he felt like a lumberer at times to, to sort of circle back to what we're talking about. I, I like Kelvin Banks better now, and we'll, we'll see how this plays out. But, Rick, I was going to ask you um, – and, Mike, you can chime in too because you said top-10 pick. These are the names we talked about last year during summer scouting. So both of you stopped me when you would take – 
Will Campbell Jr. over this player. So we talked to Olaf Ashnu, obviously. You guys taking Olaf first? Yeah. Joe Walt. We know that Mike's definitely taking Joe Walt first. Uh, J.C. Latham. I think J.C. Latham plays with a little better bend, even though J.C. was on the right side. But he's going to be left now, I think, right? Unless something's changed. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I think Campbell's better a year out than Latham was, but by the end of Latham's career, I, I thought he's a better prospect than Campbell's. Right Who would you draft first? So Latham, I would have rather taken Latham. Okay. And then the other guys we talked about, and uh, you know, uh, Patrick Paul, he was sort of a hot name. He okay. he didn't go in the first round. And then Graham Barton, who plays inside, he was a first round pick. All right, Campbell, interesting. Yeah. All right, Rick, give me the comp and the draft range, and then we'll play the old game. Yeah, I think he's a top ten talent. I think Ooh. he'll be the first offensive tackle off the board. Right now, uh, I went with uh, Tali Fuaga uh, uh, as my comp coming out just because tough strong. toughness, strength, everything like that. And Fuaga had a little bit of uh, athletic limitations, but this yeah, they're similar in the grit and toughness that they play with. So I went with Fuaga. Interesting. So I, I didn't have him. I had him as a second round guy right now. Well, oh, I can change. I, <laughs> I know offensive who, linemen who? Are, are, are a commodity. What? Who who in the second round? The guy we're talking about, Will Campbell. <laughs> Harry, I dollar bet. I don't want to do a dollar bet on that, but I'm just in terms of where we are in the summer. He was my uh, he was my offensive tackle three of the guys that I watched. Oh I liked him. Oh my. But uh, actually, I take that back. He's he's not going to get drafted, Rick. How about that? How does that make you feel? <laughs> All right. yeah, trying to get more clicks. I know. I I mean, imagine if I just said he was. Uh, Donald McNabb. Now, imagine what people would say to that. <laughs> All right. Here's the game. You ready? See if you can get one right. I mean, you got a 50-50 chance. Flip a coin. Ryan Ramchek and Andrew Whitworth. Uh, I am going to go with Mike saying Ramchek. Oh, you got that one right. That's right. That's right. And by the way, Andrew Whitworth went in the second round. You guys might hate that count, comp, but that's where I was going with that. And Andrew Whitworth is a Hall of Famer, so. We'll see who's right in 15 years. <laughs> All right, next up. LSU, by the way, games to watch if you're interested <laughs> uh, at USC on September 1st, and then Alabama, of course, November 9th. Rick, who are the Alabama edge rushers we need to worry about off the top of your head? Uh, I can't tell you that right now because they've got some new young guys coming okay. in because uh, they had two guys last year. But I'm <laughs> very intrigued about this Rice defensive end. <laughs> 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 Don't knock him. <laughs> this, this will be Banks owls. Yeah, apparently Banks knocked him. <laughs> this will yeah. be Mike's legacy. Huge Luke McCaffrey friend, Mike Ritter. <laughs> All right, next up. I was pleasantly surprised watching uh, this guy out of uh, at the University of Arizona, Jonah Sabanaya. Only allowed two sacks last year and 518 pass rush snaps. Um, let me double check the. The math here. Played 78% of his snaps at right tackle. Did kick inside to right guard. I think there were injuries a few times, so he took some snaps there as well, but he's primarily uh, a right tackle. And let's see here. Mike, you had him. Oh, you and Rick both had him at number five. Mike, I'll start with you. What do you think of Jonah? I love this guy's frame. I, I mean, he looks like an offensive lineman built in a lab, even compared to Jordan Morgan, who I thought had a great frame on the left side. He's even a little bit wider, a little bit stouter, a little bit longer. Like he is truly an ideal build. Feet at that size are incredible. His ability to move in pass pro and that Arizona offense was a run and gun he's taking a lot of deep drops he's having to pass pro for a long time very impressed with how he was able to mirror at that size so i do think he's probably more suited toward the interior just from that size uh perspective i, I do think he had a little trouble uh getting guys out of the pushing guys past the pocket off the edge um when guys did get you know we did get tested with speed so just probably a little bit more of a guard, but he probably could stay a tackle if you really want him to. The one thing I disliked was his ability to sustain blocks. I thought his hands need to improve quite a bit before I'm ready to really go to bat from his first rounder, but this is a first round caliber athlete. He was only a sophomore last year. The arrow really is pointed up for this guy. There was a lot, a lot to like about him. He could join that mix at the top of this draft truly because he has that kind of talent and what he's capable of. Let me ask you, um, 
compared to Jordan Morgan, even uh, Fuaga, and maybe even Fatanu, all those guys out there in the Pac-12, did you think those guys needed to move inside? How do you rate them in terms of where you had them stack with um, with Jonah? I thought Morgan had to move inside as well, but the okay. uh, Morgan and uh, Fuaga, I thought were probably better on the interior. Obviously, you're always going to want to give a guy a shot at tackle. It's a more valuable position. It costs more, so you can save yourself some money if a guy's good there. You try to play him there, but I thought they were probably better suited in the interior. Whereas I thought uh, Fautano was probably a tackle. And for Seven Seven Aia, it's like this far out. It's difficult to say because what Morgan was a senior. Uh, they were all fourth or fifth year guys coming out. So he was obviously quite a bit behind them from a technical standpoint, but from a pure, what they're you know capable of physically, he might be the best of the bunch. All right, Rick, you also had Sabanaya at number five on your list. What'd you think? Yeah, I thought he had some lower body stiffness. I love his size. Uh, at times I like to see him finish better with grit in the run game. Sometimes he plays with a clock in his head where uh, he may not finish before the whistle blows, but he can engulf defenders at the point. I thought uh, he was okay in pass pro, but the lower body stiffness shows up. I watched him. He struggled versus Latu last year from UCLA, just trying to mirror those movements. And then what surprised me was they started – Wait, how do you do against Rice? Huh? I didn't see that game. I didn't get down that low into the uh, – <laughs> this is just summer scouting, so I was trying to find guys that he may have to block in the league. Right as an example, I'm not sure about the Rice kid yet, but I'll get to him hopefully by the next podcast. Um, but the thing that really surprised me, and I thought he was very good at and was a different player, was he started at right guard versus Oklahoma in the bowl game. And there you see the movement in the run game. He just looked more comfortable than he did out at right tackle. So I think everybody's going to project this guy inside the guard that I think will help his value. Uh, but I saw him as a second-round pick right now. But I, I I was taken back a little bit about how efficient he played in that, uh, in that bowl game as a right guard. Yeah, I thought he was a mauler in the run game. And I didn't see – I didn't watch, obviously, all the games you watch. I, I didn't see the – the clock in his head in terms of the the, the run game stuff. I, I was impressed with how he was as a run blocker. Like both you guys, I said he need to hone his technique and pass pro. Plays the great anchor, has heavy hands, uh, but he can sometimes overset. And he, he got beat a couple times through the B gap because he was oversetting. Um, and the last thing I wrote is guessing there will be conversations about whether he's better suited for guard in the NFL because I'm always the last one to know about that. And this isn't my comp, Rick, but as you're talking about him, you know, we had the same conversations about Dominic Puny out of uh, – Kansas, because he played outside and then he moved inside once he was drafted. I I think to 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 spoil it here, I think he's a second round pick as well. Mike, where do you think he goes? And uh, don't give me the comp. Just tell me where you think he goes, and then we'll get comp, Rick's comp. I think he ends up going round one, just Ooh, because right. of offensive linemen getting pushed up boards. Yep. And, and I do think you'll see improvement again for to to be as young as he was, like still sophomore tape. And, and he may not even come out this year, right? So yeah. So I do think that the fact that he has you know three more years or a few more years to do this, I, I think we'll see him end up round one. So Rick, your comp is interesting because I don't think we ever talked about moving this guy inside, right? No, uh, Kingsley Suomatea. Yep. Uh, is uh, the reason I made that comp is because I seen the same kind of lower body stiffness and yep. the same movement stuff. That's why I had him, but I didn't see Kingsley play inside a guard. And I had a different opinion of this kid when I saw that Oklahoma game and he moved inside the guard and thought he was way more efficient as a guard than he was at tackle. Uh, what I seen this at, at right tackle this year. I think you and I both were sort of lukewarm on Kingsley and it sounds like everyone feels a little bit better about um, where John is right now. All right, Rick, you're one and two in the comp game. You have a chance to get to 500. Here are the comps, Robert Hunt and Tully Fawaga. Oh my God. Uh, I'm going to say that Mike went with Robert Hunt. Oh, you're cheating now. Two, no, two. because he moved in the guard. <laughs> you don't move guys. That's true. <laughs> that's, my, that's my other kryptonite. Steelers players, and I don't move guys. Everyone's a tackle. All right, Rick, you're two and two. With two I just to go. needed to get warmed up. Came out of the gates. I wasn't ready and prepared for that. You didn't stretch. You just started running the hundred. All right, next up, and I went back and watched this guy after you guys put him on the list. Um, he was on my list initially, but I, I ran out of time. I had to 
had things to do, Rick. <laughs> Emory Jones, also a junior, plays opposite, of course, uh, Will Campbell, right tackle. And um, let me see who, where you guys had him rank. Mike had him third, and Rick, you had him fourth. Mike, I'll let you start since you liked him a, a smidge more. Yeah, he's very oh, – it's, it's just – Thick. Uh, I mean, it's just a thickly built <laughs> offensive tackle, right? Like, I mean, 322, and it's just, you can see in that picture, like, he's got definition in his arms. Like, that's well, not. If he's 322, then Ryan's 165. <laughs> this guy is more than 322. Where the number 50 know, doesn't like, help either. He's just, and to be that big and still hold it as well as he does, like, it's just, that's a rare, you know, offensive tackle is very much an alien position. There's only a handful of people in all of humanity that can fill it. Like it's a, <laughs> it's a DNA position and he has it. So that right there, you see right off the bat. I love the posture in his sets. Uh, you know, he's not out over his toes. He's back under himself, makes it easy for him to anchor. Uh, I think his feet are okay by offensive tackle standards, nothing special, but more than good enough to stay at offensive tackle. And with how powerful he is, with just how easy um, his balance is, like I see the improvement from his freshman year, sophomore year. Like I think he's going to keep figuring it out. I just wanted to see a little bit more of a butt kicker. Like he has these immense physical tools, but it never really translated to dominance on the football field, never really saw the nastiness from him. So, Hopefully that comes in time, but that's probably the biggest worry I have with him right now because physically this guy should be, you know, a surefire first rounder, but we'll see how his career develops. What do you think, Rick? Uh, agree with everything. I think he's going to fit better in a gap scheme than a maybe wide zone scheme because of his size and ability. I think he can create movement. He does play with a clock in his head at times. I'd like to see him a little bit more, uh, how they can put this a little more tick in his neck. Uh, oh, okay. Times to finish. Uh, That's block. a new word. Yeah, but I do think that he can anchor versus most power. He was patient uh, versus counters and spins and everything. Like it's tough to get around because of his length. Although he doesn't have elite feet, uh, at times he does lunge, uh, and they'll get him on his outside edge. But I, I like this kid. I think he's going to shoot up draft boards next year as well. Yeah, I thought he had pretty good footwork and pass protection. Uh, Stout, strong versus the bull rush with ability to cut off speed rushers. So I disagree a little bit with that based on what I saw. I thought he was nimble for his size in the run game. He moved well in small areas. And um, he was in balance when he was combo blocking. In the short yardage situations, I thought he was moving the pile. So um, I actually liked him a lot. Like I didn't like him as much as Will Campbell, but it was pretty close for me. Different type players. Huh? Yeah. Good, good. Keep rolling. You're on a roll. <laughs> I love how you can't control yourself. You just have to, you can't. You I'm can't. trying. I, I really am trying this year to turn a new leaf. And How's it going? Yeah. You just not get, good. Not great. Uh, yeah, I liked Emory Jones. I was I was pleasantly surprised. I'm glad, I'm glad that I went back and watched him. Um, Rick, your comp is is borderline Don McNabb insane. What is your comp? <laughs> My comp is Dewan Jones. Come on, man. <laughs> two Dewan. I mean, two Emory Jones equals one Dewan Jones. Is that the math? I think he's high, a little bit heavier than three twenty two, in my opinion. Now, I don't think he's three eighty, <laughs> but I think that type of movement and his ability to anchor and to create movement at the point, he is a, a mauler, uh, road grader type than a more of an athletic twitch guy. So that's why I went with Dewan Jones. What round? I am in the second round right now, okay. but I can see him tending or trending to the first yep. uh, by the time it's said and done. I certainly agree with that. All right. You're tied. You're two and two. You're at 500, Rick. I, I went back and did a comp for him because I didn't give it to, I don't think I gave it to, to producer Harry. Maybe I did. But um, I'm going to go with the, my, hopefully this makes it more complicated for you. All right, Rick, who is, match the comp to the name, Cam Robinson, Jedrick Wills. I'm going to go that you said Cam Robinson. And you are now below 500. <laughs> <laughs> Mike said Cam Robinson. I said Jedrick Wills. I don't feel great about the Jedrick Wills comp, but I. I should have known that. I mean, that's that's obvious. That was, yeah. I mean, who would ever come up with Wills? 
<laughs> and he would fall for it. That's even yeah. worse. <laughs> That's my fault. I take the hit on that. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. That's all right. Um, LSU, we talked about him earlier. Games to watch. USC, Alabama. Uh, Mike, did you give a draft range? Did you say second? I, I think so. With all these offensive linemen right now, I mean, their tape is probably not like his tape's not first round right now right but it's compared to sophomores historically it's probably first round tape like he's probably going to get yeah. to the first round level okay fair enough all right next up tyler booker and rick tyler was uh on your list and not on mike or my list but he was so high on your list that he makes it his way into the aggregate top five so we'll mean? start with you top five in the first round i didn't say that no top five of the offensive linemen we're talking about today yeah, no, this guy to me has unique size, very strong, powerful in the run game. Uh, I think he plays with knee bend for how big he is. Uh, he consistently creates movement at the point, very good work in combos, strong to finish. I don't think he's going to be an outside zone type player, but I think guys with this size and this mass that try to create movement in the run game uh, will be highly regarded coming out. He's strong to set and pass pro. Uh, plays with anchor. I really like everything he does. He got a few beat a few times versus some more athletic guys through his inside edge off the snap. But I think he's a pro ready day one starter, uh, whoever drafts him. Now, if you want to downgrade him because he's a guard only, in my opinion, I don't think he could play center or tackle. Uh, but if you're drafting him, you're drafting him to be your day one starter as a guard, which sometimes will decrease the value of a guy if he's a one position guy but i think this guy is going to be a dominant guard at the next level all right i'll circle i'll, I'll um, add in these two players though one for mike and one for me they're in, interior guys as well i'm guessing you've probably seen both donovan jackson the guard at ohio state and then yes. uh, parker brailsford at alabama yes all right what are your thoughts on those guys yeah, I like Donovan Jackson, too. I think he has similar traits. I think that Booker is a little bit more sound than pass pro right now yep. than Donovan Jackson is. I think that's where the separation was for me, and I don't think – I think these two guys are, are just powerful, big human beings. And when you look at the trend this year in free agency, look at how many teams ended up trying to pay offensive guards yep. because they want to keep the pocket – from collapsing back into the quarterback. Uh, Carolina signed uh, Hunt. They signed uh, Damian Lewis from Seattle because they got uh, a quarterback that can't see when there's guys in his face. So they are going to try to secure that up front. One thing that the coach told me was, even when we had Kirk Cousins, as accurate as he is, that he's much more accurate when you don't have pressure coming in the middle. Yep. These big body guys, and look at the way these guards got paid this year. Even uh, uh, the kid that uh, came. Quinn from, Miners. Yeah. Well, look at uh, who went to the uh, Giants uh, that was with Vegas last year. The le right tackle of Vegas they're going to put inside a guard. Immanuel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. They're paying these guards and these big body guards to come in and secure the pocket and create some movement in the run game. And I think. Both Ohio State kid and this kid here are going to fit what the NFL is kind of leaning to right now. Illuminor, and they also signed John Runyon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Um, so, Mike, talk about Parker Brailsford because um, I'm going to pull the plot here. You have him potentially as a first rounder? Yes. All right. We'll see. He needs to get a lot bigger. So he was 275, I want to say, last year for Washington. But he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with – uh, gosh, who's the Texas nose tackle? Who I'm blanking on his name. Sweater. Devon Chavandre Sweat, yeah, yeah, in that uh, semifinal. And he didn't back down, man. I mean, he, he he fights. And so at 275, to hold up as well as he did was impressive. Obviously, he was only a sophomore, though. He will get bigger. Reminds me kind of like early career Tyler Linderbaum, where he's just such a good athlete, so active with his hands, can move so well that – it's just, can he get to 300 pounds? You're right. Can he, can he get to the size needed? Because, I mean, it's all there besides that. So, excited to see how he figures. I think he transferred to Alabama. So, he was Washington last year, transferred yeah. to Alabama this year. So, uh, that's a, that's probably good for his draft stock in terms of who he'll be facing now this upcoming season. The one thing that I will say, though, is he would have to fit in an outside zone type scheme. 
Yeah. Like when we drafted Garrett Bradbury, he was undersized. Now he's pretty good in the run game, but what happens if he gets has to take on a nose tackle and pass protection, those guys are going to get collapsed. They just don't have enough lead in their rear end to <laughs> anchor. So that's why these big body guys seem to be the trend nowadays. And we saw mm -hmm. how many guards have gotten paid during free agency. That's why I went with the two bigger body guys. So Donovan Jackson, Tyler Booker, and Parker Brailsford. Rick, right now, all top 50, or is that too rich? Uh, I think the first two are, I don't know, again, a two, no one's going to draft a 275-pound guard. If he comes in and weighs 275, 280, I don't think he's going to get drafted in the first two rounds. Who was the, I can't remember the name, what's the center from Ohio State a few years ago who ended up going in the what sixth round? Yeah, he was undersized. I thought he should have gotten drafted higher than he did, but he, he was brown. Yeah, because he was small. light in the pants, but he light. didn't play light in the pants. He was small. Yeah. All right. The other, only other guy that was uh, I, I watched was uh, Wyatt Millam, West Virginia. Uh, his future may end up being at right tackle, or maybe I hate to say it, maybe he moves inside as well. Uh, I think he's a senior, so he's been around the block a little bit. Um, Thought he moved well in space, had a big frame. He can move defensive lineman types off the spot. Uh, but I thought at times his footwork and pass protection left him vulnerable. So we'll see. Just a, a guy to put a put a dot next to his name and watch him as we get through this process here. All right, I think that's everybody, boys. Next week, edge rushers and interior defensive linemen. Who's going to be the first awesome. overall pick, Rick? In the draft? <laughs> uh sure <laughs> this is a draft podcast <laughs> uh i don't know we haven't gotten through all the positions yet we got to wait and see how we talk about these edge rushers but there's one in particular that i think will uh we'll, we'll make a run at it uh one last thing before we get out of here i should have talked about this at the top we can talk about it now this offensive line class feels pretty deep Last year's class, the 2024 draft class, Mike felt deeper than 2023. Where do you think this 2025 one has a chance to rank? I think it's – I really like the top, right? I, yeah. I like those two guys that we talked about. I think those guys, you can kind of pencil in top 10, 15 right now. After that, it, it's a lot of we'll see after this year. But I, I think it has a chance to have a lot of first-rounders. Like all the guys we talked about, they were all sophomores last year, You know, all second-year players. So – uh, and, and even like Parker Brailsford, who I mentioned, second year player, I think Donovan Jackson is the same. So there's a lot of youth, like it, it's a young offensive line class. So that in and of itself usually means that they'll take a next step forward and they'll be better next year. So I, I think it has a chance to be a good O-line class. You ready for this, Ryan? Dollar bet. I say there will be six offensive linemen to go in the first round next year. All right. Uh, that needs a that needs a graphic, producer Harry. <laughs> And then you splice in what Rick just said afterwards and put that on social media. Uh, Rick says the next Donovan McNabb will be drafted on the offensive line. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll be out of rice. Yeah. <laughs> no, we hit every everything there. Rick, Rick taking shots at rice. So matter. are you saying over or under six? Six is a lot. What was last year? You remember off the top of your head? It was the record. It was nine, right? Oh, gosh. All right, six. Hmm. I feel like over feels like a possibility. This class doesn't feel as deep as last year's, but it feels deeper than 2023. What do you think, Mike? Six over under? I'm going over. That's a lot. I would probably lean under right now. If All I right. Know. Well, someone's going to give Rick a dollar then. <laughs> Rick's the house. I can't lose. <laughs> I can't lose. Yeah, that's how they I'm going to say double down, extra dollar if it's six on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't want to make a dollar, did you? <laughs> All right, that's it. That's a wrap on episode 168. Next week, turning our attention to the defense, starting with edge rushers and defensive tackles. In the meantime, thanks to Rick. Thanks to my guy, Rick. Thanks to Harry for producing. And thanks to all you guys who watch and listen and comment. Have a great week, everybody.